we are recording. This is EE3050 VK8 Lecture 1. So let's look at what we're going to cover today. How everything starts up. Okay. Save this. Desktop. So today we're going to start Chapter 4, which is Time Response. Okay. And hopefully chapters four and five will kind of show you how all of these ideas come together, right? So what we will do is eventually by the end of this course, we will take our DC motor model, which is, so this is the goal for the next three weeks. So let me write that out. Uh, e3050 VK lecture one. So we're starting chapter four, which is time response. And the goal for the rest of the quarter, three weeks, whatever, is so recall our the transfer function of the motor. What was the form of the transfer function? So let's start using poles and zeros. How many poles did it have? That is, what were the what's on the denominator? So the transfer function I again define, let me be more specific. It's theta m bar, so the output shaft displacement versus the input uh, voltage, okay? So if I put a DC step, I mean, basically a step input, like five volts into a DC motor terminal. So what happens to the output shaft? It keeps spinning, yes? So the angle uh, keeps on increasing. So eventually it's a ramp function, right, at steady state. So what I have is I have a pole at the origin. I have a pole at negative beta. So this is the form of the transfer function for a DC motor alpha over S times S plus beta, given that the transfer function is defined as the output shaft displacement over the input voltage. So here it is. Yeah, turn in your homeworks. And again, if you did MATLAB on your homework, that's fine. But if you do any, not only MATLAB, any kind of code, make sure you give me the code, right? So I know uh, what, you exact, what you all exactly typed. But anyway, getting back to this. So this is the form of the transfer function for a DC motor. And the goal is to put this in, uh, put this in feedback, negative feedback, and this leads nicely into 3720, yeah. which is what you'll be doing. You'll be doing position control. So you'll be converting your DC motor into a servo motor. Right? We'll see that. And to understand this, we basically have to understand. So the goal of chapter four is this is the goal for the rest of the course. So chapter four idea, if you will, there's only one idea. How do we use poles? and zeros of the input plus transfer function to predict time response, okay? So that's so chapter four idea or basically a question which your answer is this, okay? And it's a very, very nice, elegant relationship, right? So let's look at uh, an example, that's the best way to understand this. So let's go back to our friend, the RC circuit. So let's say this is R, and R could be R7 in RC. So let's say I put V in as a function of time, U of T, okay? I'm putting a U of T because I'm assuming the capacitor has some initial voltage across it. So the goal will be to find VC of T so VC of zero plus is V initial, okay? So the goal is uh, find an expression for VC of T, assuming we won't do the general case, although the Laplace transform easily handles the general case. And we looked at this when we did chapter two, right? The Laplace transform of the input, if V in of T is a sine function, you, take, you can take the Laplace transform, it, doesn't matter, right? You can do it. But let's just look at a very simple example to get this idea. That is, V in of T, U of T is going to be V final U of T. So this is a constant, okay? So the solution is, let's write out the differential equation that describes the system. So we have V in of T in general, U of T, is IR plus 
VC of, oops, VC of T, pushing there, okay? So that's by KVL, but I is C, D, V, C, D, T, so we get this differential equation, V in of T, U of T, and the initial condition is VC of zero plus is V initial. Okay, so here is the diffy Q that describes the system. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the Laplace transform of this. Um, but in one, we will first substitute V in of T, U of T is V final U of T. So in other words, what I have into my circuit is a step input at T equals zero, some DC voltage. Okay, I have some initial condition. So can you, do you remember from 2070, what is VC of T? So what is the expression for VC of T, given that you have a final voltage, you have an initial voltage um, across this capacitor, right? So it's going to be, uh, let's see, V final plus V initial minus V final e to the minus t over tau, which is RC, and this whole thing multiplied by U of t, okay, saying that this solution is valid only for t greater than or equal to zero. But let's just check. As t goes to infinity on the right-hand side, what do you get? V final, because this drops off. That's good, okay? So going back, we have DC input, okay? Capacitor is an open circuit at DC, steady state. Okay, I don't want to say DC, steady state. And that agrees with our equation. Check. Let's check initial conditions. At t equals zero, what happens? The v finals cancel, and you get v initial. Okay, so that's good as well. And this is the form if you have a constant input, right? If you have a sinusoidal input, this can handle it no problem. In the sense, at steady state, you get a sinusoid at the same frequency. Okay, the transient response dies out. Well, that's what makes the sinusoid so sinusoidal steady state analysis so useful in the sense linear systems don't change the frequency of the input. Right? That's true even here. Uh, what is the frequency of DC? It's zero, right? Zero hertz. The output is also at zero hertz. It's a constant. Yeah. But anyway, what's interesting is let's so first thing is let's look at some terminology associated with this. So this is called as the steady state response. Okay, you might have seen this in math. Can you tell me, given that this is called a steady state, what is this called as? Transient. Okay, so this is a transient response. But we are not actually interested in this form. Right? There's another way to write this. Which is, so let me write it like this. You might have seen this as well. V final times 1 minus e to the minus t or, or rc u of t plus v initial e to the minus t over rc u of t. Yes? I can just multiply it out and then rewrite it like that. Yeah? You know what this is called? Let's look at this guy first. It doesn't matter. So what is this called? In other words, it's the response due to the initial conditions alone, right? Huh? Natural, yes. It's the natural response or more mathematically speaking, homogeneous response, okay? Homogeneous response. I'm sure I made a spelling mistake in homogeneous. But it's basically, when this input is zero, yeah, the system response is due to only initial conditions. You see that? There's just initial conditions. When this is zero, you get natural response or homogeneous response, okay? So what is this called? The force response. Okay, I don't think... I think this itself is the mathematical terminology, it's the force response, right? So we'll use forced and natural. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to relate. So, so now, we are going to relate the poles and zeros of the transfer function plus input, okay, so we're going to look at both of them, to the response, to the time response characteristics, okay? So 
So here is the time response. This is a time domain function, yes? So we're going to look at though how the poles and zeros of our transfer function and the input relate to this, the forced response. That's because since we're talking about transfer function, so we're going to assume our initial condition is zero volts since we're going to, we need transfer function, right? Therefore, uh, V initial equals zero implies V naught or VC of T, so they called it. So here it is. So we're going to look at this fellow because in this case, if you, I mean, you can, you can do the same thing here. It doesn't matter. So if you put V initial equals zero, this fellow drops off. So VC of T just becomes, I'm going to write it slightly differently. V final U of T minus this, I'm going to multiply it out. V final E to the minus T over RC U of T. Okay? So V final is a constant. So let's find, so here it is. So let's now find the transfer function h bar of s of our system. So h bar of s, let's just define it as we're interested in vc over vn. Yeah, let's just put as vn. So here is our system r. 1 over SC, as yes, I'm going into the transfer function domain, here is our VC of S, here is our VN of S. Therefore, what's the transfer function? VC over VN, I'm not going to put the S in. So how do we find it? What do we do? Yeah, this domain. So tell me what the transfer function is. You know, just using impedances. So what do you do? These are all impedances. So what, what's the... Yeah, voltage divider. So let's just do 1 over SC over R plus 1 over SC. So this will be uh, multiply and divide by SRC. So let's, I mean, multiply and divide by SC first. So it'll be 1 plus S times RC. Yes? Then I factor out an RC. And you'll see why I'm doing this. Okay, 1 over RC over S plus 1 over RC. And I'm going to write this as VC bar over V in bar. Of S. And again, you will see shortly why I'm doing this. So let's zoom out and see what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's too little of a zoom. 75. Okay, so what do you want to do? So is this clear? First of all, here is our transfer function, okay? We are going to relate the poles and zeros of the transfer function plus input to the time response characteristics, okay? So what are, so we, are, we have the transfer function here. So let's zoom back in. So note, poles, so we are only concerned with finite poles, okay? So we're of H bar of S, which is SP, or let's just abbreviate it as P. So what is the pole of this transfer function, finite pole. So in other words, what are the finite values of S that make the denominator go to zero? That is, I don't want infinities. Yeah, negative one over RC. It's got one pole, okay? So what are the finite zeros. And this will make clear why I say finite zeros, because as s goes to infinity, right, the definition of a zero is what values of s make this function go to zero. That's all. That's the definition, right? The definition of a pole is what values of s make this function go to infinity, right? So going back to zeros, if I plug in s going to infinity, this thing goes to zero. Yes? But I'm not interested in an infinite zero. I just want finite zero. Okay. So let's see. Is it 1 over rc? So if I plug in 1 over rc for s, does this function go to zero? So it doesn't. Right? So, it, so that's not it. 
So what or remember it need not have any zeros or it need not have any poles. So are there any finite zeros? No. So none. Okay, this function has no finite zeros. So none. Okay. So to be very visual, you can encode this information on something called as a TZ plot, pole zero plot, right? So what you do is on the S plane, so S is a complex number, you have real and imaginary axis. Assuming that R is positive and C is positive, okay? Notice I put an X for a pole, so for a zero, it's a little circle, right? And MATLAB has a command called, uh, I think it's called PZ map, or it's called PZ plot. We'll look at it next time, right? But it'll show you this exact plot with an X for the pole, that's a standard notation, and a zero for the zero. There is no zero here, so we just have one pole minus one over RC, okay? Is that clear? That's the PZ plot for this transfer function. So now, let's look at So we have, we're not done, right? We want to look at how the poles and zeros of the transfer function plus input, okay? Uh, how they relate to the time response characteristics. In this case, for simplicity, we fixed our input to be a step function, yes? So our input, V in of time is V final U of T, okay, constant. Again, it need not be a constant, it could be a sinusoid. It's just the PZ plot will become more complicated, right? We don't, to understand the exact idea, we don't have to look at the sine function, it's the same idea. I mean, I could have done this in general. This thing extends very well generally, but I'm not gonna do that. Let's just look at specific examples to get the idea. So this is, so what is the Laplace transform of a constant times U of T? constant over s. And this is why this u of t is very important, okay? You cannot ignore this u of t. The reason is the u of t is what gives you the s. So let's directly go to the pz plot. So what are the finite, I'm not going to say finite anymore. It's implicitly assumed we're talking about finite poles and zeros. We don't care about poles and zeros at infinity, right? It's very tricky. In the sense, in the complex plane, there's not only an infinity here, negative infinity here, there is an infinity here, and there is a negative infinity j here, right? It basically forms what is called as a Riemann sphere. Right? It, so that's that's hardcore complex analysis. We're not even doing complex analysis. We're doing like a very sub, sub, sub component of it. So anyway, you can see there are no finite zeros. There is no finite value of s, which will make this function, not transfer function, it's just a function in the s domain go to zero. Is that clear? Is there a finite value of s which will make this function go to infinity? Which one is it? Zero. So here is with that, okay? So in other words, a pure integrator, okay? If you think about it in terms of transfer function, this is not a transfer function. Let's say I had a one over s transfer function. So one over s means you integrate the input, yes? So it has a pure, it has a pole at zero. If you have a differentiator, you'll have a zero at zero. However, there is no, no practical integrator or differentiator is perfect, right? So this pole will move around zero. And that will lead to interesting practical effects. We'll talk about that in 3720. We won't talk about it in this class. But these are the ideas, right? So therefore, V out, no, it's not V out, it's VC, yeah. So Vc bar of s is going to be V final over s, I cross multiplied, 1 over Rc, s plus, whoops, scroll down, 1 over Rc. Okay, let me zoom out. So what I've done is my Vc is this transfer function times my input. I found out the form of uh, the function for my input in the s domain, given that it's constant in the time domain, v final u of t, it's this. So vc of s is v final over s times your transfer function. Again, this doesn't have to be v final over s. It could be 
omega over s squared plus omega squared, right? Then you'll have complex conjugate poles. It just becomes more involved. That's why I'm not doing that, right? So, but what is the PZ plot of this now? So what's the pole zero plot of this guy? Yeah, you just overlay him. You see that? So you got a pole at zero. Okay? And a pole at minus one over RC. So you see that it's the exact same thing. Pole at zero, pole at minus one over RC. Now, what we will do is let's find the VC of T from this guy, all right? So once we find that, we can relate, we can answer this question. The poles and zeros are the transfer function plus input. We already have that. We got two poles, no zeros. So we're going to relate the poles and zeros to the time response. So, well, let's, how do you... What do you do to find the uh, VC of T from this equation, from this expression? What do you do? Huh? Yeah, partial fraction expansion first, right? So let's see if we can guess what it's going to be. So it's going to be something of the type over S minus S plus 1 over RC. Yeah? So if this is 1, is that it? In the sense we are missing a constant. Let's see. If I put this under a common denominator and I cross multiply, I'll get s plus 1 over rc minus so this doesn't work. Let's try this. Okay? So, I mean, you can do the partial fraction expansion. So what do I get? s plus 1 over rc minus s. I get 1 over RC over S plus 1 over RC, which is almost what I want, okay? So what's missing? How do I fix this? So you see, the SS cancel in the numerator, right? You see that or no? I get 1 over RC over S plus 1 over RC, which is right here, okay? But what's missing? So this basically gives me, if you don't see this, I claim that this is equal to... You put this under a common denominator, you get S plus 1 over RC minus S. So this cancels. That's great. I get this, I get this part. So what's missing here? V final. So I just multiplied by V final. Yeah? Okay. You can still see, watch, this is the it's not magic, it's math, right? Look at this guy. The poles of your transfer function are right here. Okay? The poles of your input are right here. So in other words, if I take the inverse Laplace transform of this, you get Vc of t is V final times 1 minus, huh? Oh, okay. U of t, the projector died. Okay. So is this clear? All right. So conclusions. So some conclusions we can draw. So we're interested again in the poles and zeros of the. We don't have zeros here. Right? We'll look, do another example where we do have zeros. So the poles of the input and the transfer function. How do they affect my time response based on going from here to here and this picture? Okay. So give me some conclusions. So in the sense, poles of the input affect what? So here is the pole of the input. Where is it here? U of t, right? So in other words, it's poles of the input affect the form of the forced response. Okay? That is pole at the origin Again, when I talk about poles, right, and zeros, I'm talking about S domain. Poles and zeros don't make sense in the time domain. There's no pole and zero of this function. Right? It just doesn't make any sense. 
but the pole and zero in the S domain will definitely affect this. Uh, pole at the origin generated a step function at the output. Yes? So again, this is time domain. Okay, this is S domain. Don't mix the two. Right? That's one. Number two, poles of the transfer function, all right, basically in this case generates uh, or affects, let me use the same terminology, affects the form of, in this case, the transient response. But in general, this is very important, right? So let me, let me write it this way. Transient response, that is, let's finish it. I mean, that's, let's write it like we've written here. That is, pole at minus 1 over RC generated an exponential at the output, OK? So in other words, this is how you use this, in the sense if you zoom out, OK? So here is a pole on the real axis. So when you look at the result of a pole on the real axis in the time domain, you get exponentials. OK, because what is the form of the S domain expression? It's going to be something over S plus beta, right? The inverse Laplace transform of constant over s plus beta is the constant times e to the minus beta t. Yes? So that this will always, these are the things you have to spot from this plot. If you see a pole on the real axis, this is called the left half plane, and we'll shortly discuss this. Right? So actually, let's discuss that. Let's start looking at, fortunately, I don't have MATLAB, but anyway, let me complete this. In general, poles of the transfer function will affect total response. Right? And we'll see that later. This is in general. But let's look at some examples. Uh, for That is basically using PZ plot to predict form of time response. Okay? So here is, so is an interesting game, PZ plot. So for now, we'll just deal with poles, OK? So real imaginary. So let's say I have a pole there. Call it alpha, all right? So let's look at uh, his domain uh, function. So here, there's to be more just time function, okay? The response means you need a U of T and all that stuff, but I just want to give you the picture here. Like, so let's say I have this and assume that alpha is positive, okay? What is the S domain function? What's the form? So assume that the constant is one. The constant in the numerator doesn't matter because you only have one pole, okay? It's 1 over s minus alpha, right? What's the time function? f of t is what? e to the alpha t, OK? So therefore, so this is number example 1, if we have a system which has uh, whose, let's say, transfer function has a pole at alpha, the time response 
will have an e to the alpha t. Now the u of t is important, okay? But alpha is positive, which implies the time response. So the technical term is it's bounded or unbounded. So if alpha is positive, is the time response bounded or unbounded? Huh? It's not bounded, right? It's unbounded. So time response is unbounded, which implies, do you think the system is stable or unstable? Is unstable, okay? So in other words, you might have heard, this is called as the RHP or right half plane, okay? So what is this? So what, what is this part called? The left half plane, right? So this entire thing is LHP. So this entire thing is the RHP. So you might have heard that poles in the right half plane implies your system is unstable. You heard of that? This is why. It doesn't matter how many poles you have here. You have one of these guys, okay? Your system is unstable. And you can do a lot of things with this picture alone. So yeah, question? That's a good question, excellent question. So a pole at zero, the system is called um, marginally stable because it is stable for some inputs. It is not BIBO stable for some inputs. So you don't want to have a pole at zero, okay? Practical purposes, poles on the origin, sorry, yeah, on the origin or on the imaginary axis, they say. Because it doesn't even have to be at the origin, right? In the sense, let's look at it uh, next in the sense it could be basically complex conjugates. But the moment you have a pole on the imaginary axis or in the right half plane, practically speaking, your system is unstable. Right? Yeah. Left half plane. Yeah. The one is, the one on the RHP is. Yeah, you, you figure out where the RHP pole is and then use feedback to move this pole into the left half plane. Let's actually, let's just do feedback. You guys know how to do this, right? So let's control this. Let's take this guy, move it into the left half plane, right? Using feedback. It works beautifully. Right? It's, it's not magic. It's, it's just math, right? Now, before we get into it, let me ask you this. Let's say this pole comes closer and closer to the imaginary axis, right? How will the Give me, what will happen to the time response as opposed to this pole moving further and further away? Grows, so which grows less rapidly? If alpha is closer here, or if alpha moves further away? The closer to the imaginary axis, right? So that is, it could be that you have a pole that's very close to the imaginary axis, right? But if you look at, for example, a classic example of that system is practical integrators, right? So a practical integrator. So actually, let's look at all this. Right? So let's look at an example. So let's answer Chris's question. Let's look at an example of a system which is marginally stable, but practically speaking, unstable. It's our friend. This fellow. Remember this guy? So you talk about poles and zeros. You can't talk about time domain, right? You have to go S domain. So R, 1 over SC. So my goal is to get V in over V out. So what's V in over V out over V in, not V in over V out, V out over V in. What's that? So let's just do, uh, so that's the question. So the solution, you'll be amazed. You can understand entire 3720 with this example. Right? You can. So, it's, so we'll stabilize this, right? Oh, by the way, the maglev system I showed you has two poles. One here, and a symmetrical one over here. So it's the symmetrical one over here which causes problems. The issue with the maglev is identifying even where these poles are, you can't identify them exactly, right? Even approximately identifying them, you need to know a lot of physics, right? That's what makes that system hard to control. It's just, it's just two poles. The second order system, it's of the form S squared minus one over S squared minus beta where beta is positive. So you have S minus beta times S plus beta, 
as a transfer function for the maglev, <laughs> the minus beta is the problem. Right? The problem is getting that beta is tough. That's called system identification. Figuring out where this alpha is approximately is system identification. And that you have to use physics. Alpha and beta for a DC motor is system identification. For the DC motor, it's actually pretty... You can get pretty close practically to alpha and beta values as compared to the theoretical ones. Right? For the maglev, it's hard. So anyway. All right, so how do we find this? So let's apply. We are going to assume op amp never saturates. Okay, There are no power supplies. I mean, but the power supplies, sorry, are like plus infinity and minus infinity volts. So KCL at Vn, the S domain, so here's our friend Vn, gives the current coming in equals the current going out. So just be careful of the negative sign. So Vn, Vn is equal to Vp. So this drops off. So if you do this, you get Vn uh, over times SRC is minus V out. Okay? So V naught over Vn is minus 1 over SRC. Yeah? So where are the poles of this system? To a PZ plot. So where are the poles? There's only one. Zero. Yes? So this is an example of a system that's a pure integrator. Yes? And if you do this in the time domain, you can easily, I mean, you'll get the derivative on this. Okay? So if you look at, with respect to the input, V0, I mean, you can look at it right here. It's minus 1 over s, so it's minus 1 over r. Okay, let's just do this. This implies v naught of t is minus 1 over rc, integral tau going from minus infinity to t, v in of, whoops, tau d tau. It's an integrator, okay? So let's go back to Chris's excellent observation that I told you for some inputs, the output is not bounded. The system is marginally stable. So this implies marginal stability, okay, or poles on imaginary, and by the way, this is also called J omega, right, this is called sigma, so S is sigma plus J omega, right, That's, I mean, S is a complex number, in general, S can be anywhere in this plane, so sigma can be positive or negative, omega can be positive or negative, this, this is the notation control engineers use. They call this sigma. I mean, this you might be familiar with from 2070, SJ omega. Yeah? This one you're probably just seeing for the first time. And you might have seen it in 2070, whatever, right? So poles on imaginary axis. So let me just call it J omega axis. So imply marginal stability. So tell me an input function for which the output is not bounded. Give me an example of an input function. So it's an integrator, right? Which, simple, think simple. Right? Which input I integrate, I don't get a bounded output. Huh? The step response. If I put a step, what's the integral of a step? Huh? A ramp, right? No, no, integral of a step is a ramp. Is the ramp bounded? No, it's not, right? So this is an example, of, this is a question they actually asked. It's a common question they ask in the Berkeley PhD problems. Give me an example of a system that's marginally stable. The integrator is a classic example. Right? It doesn't matter if you have like pole even over here, right? And we'll see next lecture what complex conjugate poles give, right? Remember, as a preview, sinusoids, okay, give right, because sinusoids are of the form, the S domain function of the form like 1 over S squared plus omega, right, or omega squared. So you get S is plus or minus square, plus or minus J omega, that's what you'll get. 
So the plus or minus j omega mean you'll have poles right there, okay? So whenever you have complex conjugate poles, you have oscillations in the system. So again, this is where we are going towards, right? You look at the pole zero plot, you should be you should start getting the verbiage that oh yeah in the time domain if, if i have complex conjugate poles in the s domain in the time domain i have oscillations all right it might be damped if your complex conjugate poles are on the left half plane or it might be undamped if they're in the right half plane right that is they will grow exponentially but anyway those are all the terminology we'll get into but here's an example of a marginally stable system let's recall this fellow right so let's recall our f1 bar of s is of the type 1 over s minus alpha and alpha is positive okay so if our transfer function say we define a transfer function 1 over s minus alpha okay and again alpha is positive This is bad because if our transfer function is defined like this, let's not let me not call it V naught over V. Sorry, it doesn't have to be voltage. Right? Just call it y over x. Doesn't matter what it is. Right? It's defined as y over x. This implies transfer function has a pole in right half plane because alpha is positive. All right. This implies system is unstable, not good, okay? So let's stabilize it. So we're gonna play this trick, right? So, this, so for st stability, let us use negative feedback. So again, we're going to use block diagrams. It's actually getting into chapter five, but reduction of multiple subsystems. But just think, right? In the sense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my friend here. And this is where we'll stop today's lecture. In the sense, yeah. Oh, we don't have enough time. Oh, man. I only two more minutes. So let me give you a hint and we'll continue next time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. Okay? So let me, okay, let me do, it doesn't matter how I put this, hold on, because it's, let me put this before the function. It doesn't matter, but there's a reason why you put it here. Right? Okay? And this is where we'll continue next lecture. I'm just going to put it in negative feedback. Right? I want you to tell me now what is the transfer function. So we'll continue this next lecture. Question, find, so this is called, let's call this H feedback of S, and that's defined as Y over S over X over S, okay? So I want you to find this transfer function. And how do you find this? Well, hint, if this is Y, this is also Y, yes? What is this signal? X minus Y. This is the error signal. It's the difference between your input and output. You know what this is? This is a controller. Okay, you know what this is called as? There's a name for this controller. It's not amplifier. In control, yeah, it's an amplifier. That's right. But in control terminology, there's a name for this controller. This is the error signal. So let me give you a hint. This is going to amplify proportional to the error, right? So what kind of controller is this? No, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's all right, but it's all correct what you guys said. Amplifier, multiplier. Is it an integrator? No. So there's integrator. What's the other kind of, what is the big control you, word you keep hearing? What kind of controller? What kind of controllers people use? Integrator. Come on, what's it called? You guys know this. I know you know this. Integrator, differentiator, so what, what is that called? It's, it's what? 
No, it's not. It is math, but it's it's an, it's very nice math, right? So, I mean, all math is nice, but it's called PI, PID control. Yes. So out of the PID, what is this? No, it's not. It's not product. It's P. So, so what does P stand for? Proportional. This is the P controller, proportional controller, or the P controller, because the output is proportional to the error signal. More the error, more this guy ramps up. Okay. So this is a P control for a first order system. P control is enough. Okay. For second order. P control may not be enough. You will, you might get steady state error. That's all 3720. We're not going to get into all that. We can just see though how a P controller can be used to stabilize this, and we'll see it next time. I'll next time I'll bring my oh, shoot. Can one of you bring your laptop because we need to use MATLAB. We'll do this in Simulink, and we will see how the poles move. All right. Yeah, bring in your laptop because I need to use one of your laptops because my Mac doesn't connect to this. I don't have MATLAB on this. Yeah, loaner is fine as long as I have MATLAB on it. I don't care. <laughs>